Customs of the Tagalog by Juan de Plasencia presented by Group 2. In this topic, we will examine his work by gaining a better understanding of the customs and tradition that have shaped Philippine society over the centuries. The objective of our discussion is first to understand the cultural practices and beliefs of the Tagalog people during the 16th century, including their social structure, economy, religion, and daily life, and also to appreciate the diversity and richness of Philippine culture including the unique customs and tradition of different ethnic groups and the importance of preserving and promoting cultural heritage and lastly to draw a connection between the past and present including how Tagalog customs and tradition have evolved over the time and how they continue to influence Philippine culture today. Now, let's first tackle the background of the author, Juan de Pasencia. His real name is Joan de Puerto Carrero del Convento de Villanueva de la Serena. Juan de Pasencia was born in the 16th century and died in 1590. He grew up in the region of Extremadura during the Golden Age or Siglo de Oro of Spain, and he is a Franciscan missionary. The account of Juan de Pasencia entitled Customs of the Tagalog was due to his missionary work here in the Philippines. As I've said a while ago, he was the one who wrote the Customs of the Tagalog. Let's proceed to the historical background. Customs of the Tagalog was written in the year 1589 during the Spanish colonial period. Juan de Placencia was tasked by the King of Spain to document the customs and tradition of the colonized or natives. He was tasked based on arguably his own observation and judgment. During the first century of Spanish rule, colonial officials had a hard time running local politics because of the limited number of Spaniards who wanted to live outside Intramuros. Due to a shortage of Spaniards living outside Intramuros, may have made difficult to colonial officials to establish a strong presence in the local communities, understand their customs and practices, and effectively manage the local polity. And because of that, friars instructed to supervise Filipino Gobernador Silio. Because of the Spaniards allow Filipinos to hold the position of Gobernador Silio. Customs of the Tagalog is written through the eyes and hands of the Spaniard. During the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, many Spanish authors wrote about the culture and customs of the local population, including the Tagalog people. However, these accounts were often written from a colonial perspective which tended to emphasize the differences between Spanish and local cultures. The importance of the work of Juan de Placencia. They provide a valuable insights into the customs, traditions, and way of life of the Tagalog people during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. Understanding the customs, traditions, and way of life of the Tagalog people during the Spanish colonial period can offer a valuable information and understanding of our culture and history. It highlights the significance of investigating this period to gain insights into the Tagalog people's past practices and beliefs. His work is a primary source because he personally witnessed the events and observation. It's said here that the work of Juan de Placencia classified as a primary source because he had a personal experience and witnessed the events and observation that being described, which provide original and unfiltered information from his own perspective. It remains an important source for scholars and historians interested in the history and culture of the Philippines. Customs of the Tagalog, just like any other colonial text written during the Spanish colonial period, it was intentionally made to provide an exoticized description of the Tagalog natives. The customs of the Tagalog along with the colonial text from the Spanish colonial period were intentionally written to present an exoticized depiction of the Tagalog people, emphasizing their differences from the Spanish colonizer. 
the word exoticized description refers to a portrayal or representation of a people or culture that emphasize their perceived differences from the dominant culture or society, often emphasizing their unusual qualities. It was written by Juan de Placentia because he was tasked by the King of Spain to document the customs and tradition of the colonized or native, based on arguably his own observation and judgment. As I said a while ago, Juan de Placentia wrote the customs of the Tagalog because he was assigned by the King of Spain to document the customs and tradition of the colonized Tagalog people. The work was based on his own observation and judgment, indicating that his personal perspective and biases may have influenced his description and interpretation of Tagalog culture. Moving on to the content analysis, understanding the historical information. The context of the document is to acquire truths regarding social classes, government, administration of justice, and inheritance, slave and dowries. It also pertains to how hard life it was during the Spanish colonial period. At this point, we will be discussing the political system and role during the period. Let's start discussing with the government. The land area was divided among the whole barangay, especially the irrigated portion. In this period, no one from a different barangay could cultivate land unless they inherit or buy the land. In their community, there is they called barangay, the smallest administrative division in the Philippines from the word balangay. Tagalog society was organized into a barangay which were independent from one another and had a hierarchical class system. Barangay, tribal gathering ruled by chief. The account said that the barangay system came from the people that were in the balanghays or the boat. And when they settled here in the Philippines, they made their captain of the boat as their datos or chief. There is this exact statement of Juan de Placentia to prove and give evidence to those systems happening in the particular period. There were many of these barangay in each town or at least in a count of wars. They not settle far from one another except in friendship and relationship. These people always had chief called by them datos, who governed them and were captains in their wars and whom they obeyed and reverenced. To expand our knowledge, let's talk about what is Datu. Datu is the chief who governed the people and were captains in their wars, whom they obey and reverence. According to the account of Juan de Placentia, our ancestors had chief that they called Datos, which are the one who are leading in the barangay. Let's proceed on social classes. According to the statement of Placentia, he said that, in addition to the chief who correspond to our knights, there were three castes, nobles, commoners, and slaves. There are three status or castes within a barangay. The maharlika or nobles, the aliping na mamahay or the commoners, aliping sa gigilir or the slave. To expand our knowledge about the three castes, here are some explanation to understand their status. The first class is the Maharlika or the Nobles. These are the people who are born free, do not need to pay taxes, must accompany the datos in war. Maharlika were the highest social class or caste in ancient Philippine societies. These are the ruling class consisting of wealthy and powerful families who held political and economic power. The Maharlika enjoyed privileges and honors that were not available to the lower classes, such as exemption for the paying taxes, the right to own land and slaves, and the right to bear arms. The second class is the Aliping na Mamahay or the Communists. They have their own properties but has to serve their own masters. The Aliping na Mamahay were the common people who made up the majority of the population. They were free citizens who owned their own land and property and could engage in trade and commerce. 
However, they were still considered to be a lower status than the Maharlika and were required to pay tribute or taxes to their rulers. And the last class is the Aliping Sagigilir or the slaves are those considered to be slaves who serve their masters or can be sold off. The Aliping Sagigilir were the lowest social class or caste in ASEAN Philippine societies. They had no rights and were considered a property rather than human beings. They were forced to work for their owners without pay and could bought and sold like any other commodity. During the period, there is this practices called marriage customs. At this point, courtship begins with paninilbihan. In the traditional courtship in customs of the Tagalog people, the first stage is called paninilbihan. During this stage, the man expresses his interest in the woman by doing kind deeds for her and her family. This is a way for the man to demonstrate his worthiness and sincerity to the woman and her family. Prior to marriage, the man requires to give dowry. Here is another statement of Placentia. Dowries are given by the men to the woman's parents. If the latter are living, they enjoy the use of it. The man was expected to provide gifts to the bride's family as a sign of his sincerity and commitment to the relationship. The giving of gifts was seen as a way for the man to demonstrate his worthiness to the woman's family and to show that he was capable of supporting and providing for his future wife. During the period, they allow divorce in several grounds and the several grounds of divorce are adultery, negligence, cruelty, and insanity. Now, let's tackle about the religious belief during the period. There were no temples or sacred places in which Filipinos would worship. However, ceremonies and worship are celebrated in the house of the Dato, which they call Simbahan. Simbahan, a place to worship. The word Simbahan means a place to worship which is constructed at a large house since the purpose of it is to house the people of barangay during the celebration. But Hala, one of the many idols that they worship. The author believed that the name Bathala signifies as all-powerful or maker of all things. Their manner of offering sacrifice was to proclaim a feast and offer to the devil what they had to eat. The term devil is figure in the traditional belief system. However, they did believe in a variety of supernatural beings, including spirits and deities, that could be either benevolent or malevolent in nature. In the religious customs of our native, they have distinguished 12 kinds of devil's priests. Let's discuss one by one. The first one is the Katolanan, priest from a people of rank, referred to a man or a woman. This office was an honorable one among the natives who was believed to have the ability to communicate with the spirit world. Next is the Manggagaway. They pretend to heal the sick in order to deceive others. Manggagaway are not legitimate healers but rather fraudulent individuals who use deception and witchcraft. Another is the Manisalat. They can cast remedies to couples for them to abandon one another. This priest had the power of applying such a remedies to lovers that they would abandon and despise their own wives. Manisalat priests were believed to have the ability to use their remedies and charms to influence the emotions and actions of lovers. And another is the man Kokolam. They can emit fire from himself which cannot be extinguished. Man Kokolam, whose duty it was to emit fire from himself at night, once or oftener each month, this fire could not be extinguished nor could be 
emitted except as the priest swallowed in the orger and filled which falls from the house, and who live in the house where priest was swallowing in order to emit this fire from himself, fell ill or died. We call it now mangkukulam, a witch or a person employing or using a kulam. The fifth devil priest is called Hokloban, much more powerful than the Mangagawai, in which they can kill anyone without the use of any medicine. They can also heal those who are ill. Another kind of witch of greater efficacy than the Mangagawai, without the use of the medicine and by simply saluting or raising their hand, they killed whom they chose. But if they decide to heal those whom they made ill, by their charms, they did so by using other charms. Next is the silagan. They would tear out and eat the liver of those they saw were wearing white. If they saw anyone clothed in white, they think that to tear out his liver and eat it, thus causing his death. Another one is the magtatanggal. They would go out at night without their heads and put it back into their bodies before the sunrise. His purpose was to show himself at night to many persons without his head or entrails. In such a wise the devil walked about and carried or pretended to carry his head to different places and in the morning returned it to his body remaining as before alive. Today we know this creature as the Manananggal. Next is the Osuwang. Tribesmen reported that they saw Osuwang who can fly and murdered a man and ate his flesh. Equivalent to Sarcisur, they say that they have seen him fly and that he murdered men and ate their flesh. Today we know this as an Aswang. Next is the Manga Gayoma. They would seduce their partners with charms and other accessories so they can deceive them. Manga Gayoma, they made charms for lovers out of herbs, stones, and wood which would infuse the heart with love. Thus did they deceive the people although sometimes through the intervention of the devil, they gained their ends. Today, the Gayuma is known as a Filipino love spell to help the love life of those with lonely or broken hearts. Another is the Sonnet. This devil help people to die. They can also know if the soul they help to die can either be saved or not. Sonnet, which is equivalent to Pitcher, it was his office to help one to die, at which time he predicted the salvation or condemnation of the soul. It was not lawful for the functions of the office to be fulfilled by others than people of high standing, on account of the esteem in which it was held. Today, we know that a sonnet was essentially like a bishop. Second to the last is the Pangata Hojan. They can predict the future. It was a soothsayer and the one predicted the future. Lastly is the Bayugin. These are men who are in the nature of a woman, signified a katokyan or has a charisma, a man whose nature inclined toward of a woman. After discussing the religious belief, let's proceed on burial practices. The deceased was buried beside his house and if they were a chief, he was placed beneath a little house of porch which they constructed for his purpose. The chief or high status individual would be buried beneath his structure as a sign of respect and honor. This practice of burying the dead near their home and constructing special structures for chiefs or high status individual was a common practice. It was believed that by burying the deceased near their home and in a special location, their spirits would continue to protect and watch over their family and community. A short summary of the customs of the Tagalog. 
This account of Juan de Placencia strengthens the claim that even before the Spaniard colonized the Philippines, Filipinos already have their own set of tradition, customs, practices, beliefs, and government that they abide to. Customs of the Tagalog was one of his writings that tackles about everyday living of the ancient Filipinos, their social status, customs, traditions, and beliefs of the Tagalog. It also provided the first form of civil code used by local governors to administer justice. At this point, Customs of the Tagalog by Juan de Placencia provides a valuable insights into the Tagalog culture during the 16th century. There are potential weaknesses in its findings. Placencia was a foreigner who may have a limited understanding of Tagalog culture and language. This could have resulted a misinterpretation or misrepresentation of cultural practices and belief. In his account, he writes customs that were new to him. In addition to this, he uses adjectives that would look the culture of the Tagalog as exotics to the world. The discussion of Philippine history reveals the importance of recognizing the diversity and complexity of the country's past and understanding how historical events and processes continue to shape the present. We can gain insights into the issues of social justice, cultural identity, political power, and develop a deeper appreciation for the challenges and achievement of the Filipino people. Overall, Customs of the Tagalog provides a valuable insights into the daily life and cultural practices of the Tagalog people during the 16th century and it remains an important historical document for scholars and researchers interested in a Philippine history and culture. Customs of the Tagalog contributes to two different times. First, during the time when colonizers did not know about the Philippines. Second is for the present time to understand how the pre-colonial culture started and developed. A short quotation before we end, a quotation from Tudor Roosevelt. The more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. Thank you for listening and I hope you learned something from the discussion. Have a great day!